Hi, welcome to another episode of the CTO to CTO podcast. In today's challenge accepted series, Piotr speaks to Christoph Gerber about the challenges of building a successful enterprise software startup. Christoph, the CEO of Talent One, talks about what makes the platform stand out from other marketing tools on the market, like being able to manage customer loyalty and rewards all in one place on an enterprise scale. Christoph also founded one of the biggest German takeaway delivery startups, Lieferando, and shares his personal insights on building diverse teams, investments, and the need to reinvent your business in order to stay relevant on the market. Let's begin. Today, my guest is Christoph Gerber, founder of Talon One. Before Talon One, he founded the Live Rando DE, then successfully merged with Takeaway.com. I can't wait to ask Christoph about his professional career, what drives him, uh, and what did he learn along the way. Hi, Christoph. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Hi, Piotr. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on the call. Okay, so first, let's get back a little bit to the 2009. Um, It's the year you founded the Life Rando DE. How it all started? Basically, I was in uni and um, my friend Kai and Jörg uh, reached out to me and said, hey, we got this idea for a food delivery platform that works well in New York. Yep. And I was just like, whatever gets mm -hmm. me out of uni, I'm all in. So at that point, we had no idea around how big food delivery yep. can become. Um, we re really weren't interested in or for me at least, I wasn't interested in, oh, this is how the market's mm -hmm. going to develop. There's a general trend to food delivery. I was just like, whatever gets me out of uni fast, uh, I'm gotcha. all in. So uh, have you had any you know, specific future plans back then? Did you expect Life Rando to become such a success? Uh, not, not really. I mean, if you look at the mm -hmm. first business plan that we wrote, it actually says that we are in Cologne uh, four years later. Yeah. So a city. So I think I was always mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. conservative around being successful. Uh, if you ask Kai and Jörg, they're a bit more bullish on this can become big. I was always skeptical, but I'm in general a very uh, skeptical person, gotcha. I would say. Pragmatist. Um, yeah, not, I'm, I'm just more like, mm, I rather think, in general notion, I think everything will turn mm -hmm. out okay, but I'm not a person who thinks everything gotcha. is going to be great. Um, so I don't think it, I never thought it's becoming a, it will be a disaster, <laughs> but I never, I rather under promise and over deliver. And that's also from my personal view on mm -hmm. the world. I rather don't get too excited and then be surprised mm -hmm. than thinking about having or like lying to myself, thinking I have a big, big successful business when it might not become That's successful. Gotcha. Uh, low expectations uh, can only surprise you the positive way. It makes perfect sense. A hundred percent. Okay, so you started this uh, this company, uh, uh, as you said, a little bit accidentally, but uh, there, there, there must be this moment that you found out it, it, it is a hit. It, it got the traction. When was it? What, what was that moment? I think it really became obvious when... Uh, Delivery Hero started in the German mm -hmm. market afterwards, and we could see that um, there's more interest in, in the market to food delivery. And we started the merger talks with Delivery mm -hmm. Hero and Takeaway. Um, that, that, I think, for me was the point where I was like, okay, maybe there's something okay. bigger here. Uh, maybe we have, uh, there's a pathway to becoming really, really successful. That, that's interesting. Um, To, to, to grow the company, uh, B2C company, food delivery, a lot of logistics, uh, people to hire. I, I uh, imagine you needed to found uh, a funding, a uh, solid partner. What were your criteria searching for an investor? Uh, I mean, at the beginning, just when we started mm -hmm. raising, it was just after the financial crisis. Um, so... We really had problems raising our first money. And the first money we got was 150,000 yes, euros. Yep. That was our first funding round. So if you think about 150,000 now, um, that's nothing. It's nothing, um, yeah. The, the pre-valuation that Talent One, eh, not the Talent One, mm -hmm. that Liverando had, the initial, like the first round, and that was we already built a working prototype. Mm -hmm. um, not good, but we already transmitted orders. Gotcha. The valuation was 700,000 euros. Yeah. 
that's the first valuation. So nothing compared to what we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were really scrambling to get 10,000, 30,000 euros from individual investors. Going forward, um, we were always competing against Delivery Hero. And Delivery Hero did an incredibly good job in raising money and building out a story, which we didn't do very, very well. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always... We're not a good, we were not good fundraisers. So at that point, we basically took money from whoever would money give to <laughs> us. Very, very different to how I would do it now or how am I doing it now with Talent One. But we didn't have the luxury to really choose um, who, who we want to work with. All the big VCs um, rejected us. Gotcha. Index yeah. rejected us. Exa rejected us. Highland Capital rejected us. Besim, everyone, every, you name a big VC in, the, in, in Europe, they they rejected talent uh, they rejected Liverando, and the only one who kind of believed in us was Macquarie Capital, mm-hmm. which is an Australian investment bank, and they are I would say key success factor to the IPO and everything that happened afterwards. Gotcha. Uh, I remember those times. Actually, we started Divanta with uh, my brother Tom around it, and we also were working on the first product, which was you new. Know, for a knowledge management kind of enterprise wiki and it was also a failure it was very tough to you know to find any um, investors and after the crisis everyone were cutting the costs so you can imagine uh, w- what is a key to success in this kind of you know delivery business i think what we did well because we didn't have so much money um, was really the focus we put on product and on operations uh, as an example, I think when we merged with Takeaway, the German marketing team was six or seven people. Mm-hmm. The equivalent team for a Delivery Hero for the German market was around 40. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is, I think, what we excelled in was just going down into every single number. We like really putting a lot of work into our business intelligence Mm -hmm. and making decisions based out of that Mm -hmm. and really looking at every single customer cohort how to make that cohort more profitable gotcha and um yeah rather saying we don't compromise we we compromise on growth for um good numbers um so not not taking every every possible customer but really thinking around what makes sense um and another thing that we did I think, which made us a bit different at that stage. I think by now everybody's doing it. We didn't look at Germany as a market. Mm -hmm. We looked at each postcode. Each in Germany postcodes are, I think in Poland, they're very, very narrow. In Germany, they're a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, But so we looked at each postcode as a market. We said, how do we perform in each single market? So we had, I don't know, 10,000 markets or that's, I don't know, 3,000 in Germany that we looked at. And these were the markets that we wanted to win. So we took the whole thing to a very, very granular level. Mm-hmm. I think that's very common now. At that, I think like, I don't know, 10 years ago, this was very new, the way we, we looked at things. Th- that's, uh, that's very interesting. So a lot of scrutiny in the process. Very, very detailed, very detailed. And not, and I mean, one thing is, if you if you reduce a marketing te- marketing team to seven people, what we could see was that the output was actually better because if you have some five people in display advertising, and you give them a budget, they run to all the companies and ask for offers. Mm-hmm. Instead of if you reduce the team, they would go to the three four companies they would already know they would get yeah. the best offers from. Um, so the output was the same or even better. Because we achieved it in a in a in lesser time. Absolutely, that, that's a good point. Do you think that there is uh, one single uh, feature of your character that uh, lets you build this uh, this company and make it successful? I think if I would have built it myself, it would have been a big failure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's we. It's always a mix of characters mm-hmm. and. I know what where I'm really good at, but I also I would say my weaknesses are dominate are way more are way bigger than my strength. Um, and it was great that I had Jörg and Kai with me who re- were really complementary. Mm-hmm. So each of us 
is a very different person. If if you if you know us three, we are very very different, all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was what made the company successful. Gotcha. That we're not th- that we were not three McKinsey guys, but very <laughs> very different. Yeah, that <laughs> good point. Um, yeah, that was. And it's the same. It's the same for Talon One now. My co-founder Sebastian at Talon One. He's a very very different person to me. Um, from a character, from the way he does things. Um, Mm -hmm. And Talon One would, again, wouldn't be where it is right now without having such a strong Mm -hmm. co-founder who who basically does all the work that I really suck at. Yeah, that that was also a very humble uh, answer. So I think that maybe... um... Uh, It's it's, it's true, it's true. I think Talon One would be a failure if if I would do it myself. But Lieferando wouldn't exist if I would have done it myself. Gotcha. No, no, not, a, not a chance in the world. Gotcha. So uh, from what we already, uh, what was already said here, uh, you are kind of, you know, uh, humble pragmatist um, with, with a lot of uh, attention to details, which, you know, makes um, pre- pretty good profile for successful entrepreneur i guess <laughs> cool <laughs> let's let, let's see yeah done it once i have to i have to do it twice uh, to to confirm that i'm not a one-hit wonder <laughs> okay uh eventually you you merge with takeaway.com how uh, how it uh, all goes so from a financial perspective it was the best decision uh, we could have made um for me it became clear at that point that the company was on a track to become so big that I didn't enjoy working there anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually enjoy working on product and grinding mm-hmm. and like figuring out solutions. Yeah. If you look at food delivery, it's in the end, it's a process business and I couldn't see myself keep focusing on these products gotcha. on pro- the product on the process level. If you look at the website now, I mean, most of the stuff was, is, is still the stuff that we did back then. Then obviously there's a lot of stuff happening in the background, which I would say I don't enjoy mm-hmm. anymore. And it becomes so big that I didn't see myself mm-hmm. being being in a leadership position in there. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, absolutely. Uh, so after the exit, um, you invested into a few startups. What was your criteria? So I started investing because I think everybody who made a bit of money in in any kind of startup uh, city or scene starts investing because he thinks it's that's what you should do. Mm-hmm. I actually then figured out I don't really enjoy startup investing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really in the last couple of years, I haven't invested basically at all in startups. Um, what I do now is I have two friends who I invest with. So if they invest, I... Double, I do the same amount that they do, mm-hmm. but I don't do any due diligence and um, any kind of detailed analysis. It's like if these two guys invest together and then I just say, okay, you have a blank. You you do whatever I, you, I do, whatever you guys do, and they get all the rights for my shares so they can do all the legal work and everything, and I don't want to be involved. Mm-hmm. I figured that if I look back at what I did – what were the companies that that I invested in that were successful is basically the companies that um, I don't need to need to help. So the companies that where I see the founders are so strong and mm-hmm. so so talented that I can't help them. That's the companies where I actually invested a lot of money, um, and that's with the companies that are successful. I think most of the people that invest in companies do that with a criteria or I can help them. I have industry expertise. Um, I can add a lot of value. I think if you want to add value to a cost, to a investment, that's already the wrong approach. <clears throat> you should invest in companies that don't need your help. That's my thesis. Or, no. or found another company by yourself. Uh, I think the biggest value creation is actually, yes, the, the if you're just looking from a financial return um, is building your own company that's where you make the most money and i don't invest i don't take pleasure in investing and being involved in a lot of small companies or a lot of other startups um so i think the main criteria why you should invest in startups is if you enjoy working with 
a lot of different companies, a lot of different topics. It's just not something I enjoy. If I have time, I'd rather go hunting, go to the outdoors, go into the forest, uh, work on my cars, but not worry about startups. Gotcha. So this is how the idea of founding Talon One uh, came up? No, so Talon One um, basically came out of out of Lieferando. We built a Lieferando version on a so Talon One version one at Lieferando because we had to compete on a better level with um, Delivery Hero in terms of promotions and there were promotions all over the place. And what I've seen is that we actually always build promotions on a use case base. Mm -hmm. So we went to the development team and said, we want this and that. Then this feature was delivered. And two weeks later, we needed a different version of that mm -hmm. feature. And then it has to go back to the, to the dev team and took another six weeks. And when I left, in when we started thinking about Talon One, that was in 2015, that was way before the whole headless Or it kind of we, Lieferando was already running on a microservice yep. um, architecture. I think we're quite early due to our brilliant CTO, who is now the CTO of Tier, the Tier app, the mobility company. He was the one just saying, this is the way to go. And um, so we started with a microservice architecture actually in 13. Um, so I think that was mm -hmm. quite early. And The, my basic idea was we have to, there has to be a promotion API out there. You start doing everything with external APIs. You have an AWS, you have an Optimizely, yep. uh, you have a Snowflake, you have a Redshift, you have everything becomes an API first approach. So why is there no backend solution or an API solution for the promotion engine? And this basically was my thesis that we have to build this ourselves and sell this to big enterprises gotcha that that makes perfect sense um maybe uh you can give us a short overview what talon one is like i personally know but uh, i guess some of our listeners may be uh not aware of so if you can give okay, us so, a brief overview it would be perfect yeah so what talon one basically is is in a nutshell is a rules engine focused on promotions And if we look at promotions, we think about, or we at Talent One think about referral marketing, product bundling, gift cards, wallets, loyalty programs, customer ledgers, uh, easy discounts, product coupon, uh, coupons, vouchers, um, yeah, and again, referral scheme. And mm -hmm. we think you can't separate those things. Yeah. Maybe you have a coupon that works as a referral, so works as a referral coupon, But ultimately, adds loyalty points, and when you enter the coupon, also gives you a product bundle. Um, so we see you can't separate all of those things if you want to make it really work <clears throat> and move away from very easy 10% discount um, with a coupon. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is what we've been building for uh, five years now. Isn't it like the e-commerce platform already have promo engines? Like Yeah, I think I would say every one has their own promotion engine already. Exactly. But it's really yeah. the question: Is it good enough? Mm. Um, and if you're just starting your business and you, I don't know, you're like a ten-person company, Talent One might be way too big for you, and you don't need the capabilities. Yeah. If you think about an enterprise level traffic and enterprise level of amounts of campaigns you have to run where you need version control, where you need complete audit, where you need to have mm -hmm. an audit trail mm -hmm. around what's happening, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where you need to have different departments working on different campaigns and they can't, cannot overlap and you have to create rules around which campaign can be fired when, um, depending on a region, different currencies, diff it becomes very, very complex. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I would say, yeah, in Magento, for example, they have basic CRM solutions. Mm -hmm internally you can send in a crn email through magento to all the customers i doubt any serious business is using of course, that yeah and this is what i would say is where talent one comes in you can run promotions yes if you're really serious about running promotions on a highly effective good return base you have to move away from your 
existing, let's say, call it shitty legacy system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. So in other words, um, what makes Talent One special is the ability to work at you know, enterprise scale, meaning not only performance, but also all the edge cases they have. Like, as you said, uh, you know, uh, internationalization, uh, multi-store, uh, very flexible um, rules uh, engine and, and, and so on. Would you like to add something to this, like what makes uh, it special? Yeah, it's basically that we can, I mean, if you look at the customers that we work with, it's very, very flexible. We, I would say we can cater for nearly, or we haven't really encountered in, uh, a problem that we can't solve on a, on a promotion, in mm -hmm. the promotion space. And we solve with the same engine, we solve or we run all promotions for a Ticketmaster in the U.S., a Burger King in the U.S., but also a Zipcar, which is a car sharing company, or um, Office Depot in, in the U.K., or JD Sports in the U.K. Yep. So it's from fashion to like to office office um, supplies to car sharing to food yep. um, to install food to ticketing. Mm -hmm. It's the same system, and we solve all the quests, all the promotion promotional issues for them with one solution. I think that the, the, the API first approach you guys have is great because uh, it's not only about headless or microservices, it's all, also or maybe even foremostly about inviting other parties to the product ecosystem you are building. Uh, what are the most important uh, players in this ecosystem for Talon One? I mean, we are kind of agnostic, I would say. Mm -hmm. We don't really care who we work with. We see there are a couple of clients that we work well with. Um, one is, for example, View Storefront, mm -hmm. which comes out of out of your uh, your space. Then we got Commerce Tools, which works great with Talon One, but um, also the likes of Abrace or Itrable. Um, and particle segment. Mm -hmm. These are all companies that we work closely with um, in the past, and uh, that we like engage nearly on a daily level. Where we are either in the commerce tools example, we are replacing the internal promotion engine. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, for brace, for brace, we trigger communication. Or brace is pulling coupon codes and perform. Um, promotion campaigns out of Talon One and inserts them into their communication. Mm -hmm. And then you got Segment and Empartical who enriches the Talon One database around uh, customer segments and customer behavior. Mm -hmm. So they can say, oh, this customer is part of a segment A and therefore he gets a different set of discounts. Gotcha. Makes perfect sense. So a lot of synergies. Um, how about the adoption of the product? Mm. Do you need to educate the market? Because I, I'm asking because you know it's uh, it's different from this typical approach we just discussed that you have this simple but just working out of the box uh, marketing engine inside your CRM or uh, platform, and here you have something you need to integrate. Maybe which is, or maybe it's not. You know, difficult to understand for marketing guys how this adoption looks like. Now what we see is what happens mostly is that you have a development team, product team, and marketing team sit together discussing, we need to really rework our promotion engine. And then somebody goes out and starts looking for what's in the market. And if you're serious about your promotion engine, the only relevant company in the market is Talent One. Mm -hmm. And then you reach out to us, and then we see how we can help you. And... Um, This is normal. Like this is, I would say, ninety-five percent of our our growth comes from people reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, can we please use your product?" Yeah. Gotcha. So it's uh, it's not that tough that I uh, found it. Like that's perfect. Uh, can you tell us about your most interesting use case? Uh, the the one you are most proud of for Talon One. Um, I would say the most impressive one for now at the moment is with COVID that Ticketmaster had to cancel all their concerts mm -hmm. in the US and Canada and you got concert cash. Mm -hmm. So basically you got a credit yep. from Ticketmaster for your um, for your concert. 
But the company that actually is handling that credit and that has the wallet and the ledger for that customer is Talon One. Okay. So we hold over one billion US dollars in ticketing credit for Ticketmaster.com. Amazing. And that yeah. shows you kind of how well we integrate it into our into our customers and um, yeah, how 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 far we actually have come that a company as big as Ticketmaster Live Nation trusts us with that much of their core business. That's really amazing. Congratulations on this case. It's really cool. Um, what are the growth barriers for uh, for you as a company for Talon One as a product? I don't really see, I would say, growth barriers. It's again, how do you scale growth? And um, I think we're quite comfortable where we are right now. Uh, I've done the hockey stick crazy race with Liferando. And now for us, for us it's really good to keep on delivering a great product, um, to keep on delivering um, value to the customer. And at the moment, I think we achieved something that every customer we have could would be would be a customer testimonial to to us. Gotcha. And this mm-hmm. is this is what is most relevant to us. Gotcha. So it's uh, more more about you know sustainable uh, organic growth, building relationships. Um, yeah, I think a, a good company will always find its purpose, and we don't need we don't need uh, the hyper growth anymore. We've done that. <laughs> You don't need to show anyone that you are capable of doing these things. You already did it. Okay, uh, let us let me switch to more general questions. I always ask the same questions, never got uh, to the, the same answer twice. <laughs> so how do you see the, the future of e-commerce enterprise software market? I mean, I posted a LinkedIn post yesterday with SAP uh, being killed or uh, being shredded on the stock market yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it will move more and more to players like the commerce tools and um, additional software like View Storefront, Talent One, um, specialized communication platforms. Mm-hmm. So we will have more uh, kind of an uh, an orchestra of best of breed mm-hmm. instead of an SAP hybris commerce cloud monolith, mm-hmm. which they pretend is moving into a microservice architecture but i think just from design and the way they handle things will eventually die and um i shared one note we spoke to sap once uh, because we had a customer who was running or a potential customer who was running on sap commerce cloud wanted to integrate talent one and the hybris management actually said to us we cannot integrate you or really help you because we can't get the we can't give the customer the impression that Um, mm-hmm. Talent One delivers a better value on the promotion part mm. uh, than the commerce cloud does. Mm. So I think that just shows you a general problem with this with these big big players. I would say they are arrogant in my point of view, and eventually it will not survive. Mm-hmm. At least not for the product. I mean, they will always survive. They will always be big, but the product can't hold up. the The speed and the quality they deliver. And the way they just try to sell big products with less and less value yep. um, will change the landscape dramatically. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, usually, uh, usually we we got here opinions about some tech trends and you know this kind of stuff. But I I really appreciate this answer. Uh, not saying that I you know maybe fully agree with that, but it's uh, from business perspective. So. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And in my recent talk with Adam Sturak, uh, founder of Malting, he also shares his view on this. He he created this landscape of how the uh, platform, e-commerce platforms are, are doing, uh, how they are tricking this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, legacy you, you just said about. Uh, very interesting one. Uh, thank you. Um, so just adding to that, I don't think they will ever die. And they're just too big to that. But what they will do is eventually buy someone else to become uh, top of the curve again. And then they will screw that up. And then they will buy the next one to be top top of the game again. I think the whole way of software mm-hmm. development is more and more commoditized. So what you needed the an SAP like 10 years ago or 20 years ago is not something you need anymore. 
I would say it's yeah, basically absolutely. like an or- it's basically like an oracle. The only reason why Oracle is still so big is because it's such a pain to remove them um, out of your system. It's not that they're the best, and I would probably agree. I would probably say it's the same for SAP. It's not that they're the best in what they do. They're just the biggest, have the best sales team, and are already integrated everywhere, and that's why people keep using it. Yeah. But are they are they delivering the best value for money? Hundred mm-hmm. percent not. Isn't it like this is just a fate of this technology adoption life cycle? You know, this this bell curve that you have this chasm and then you are approaching the majority of users and so on. Because I, I this is how I see it, you know. Uh, it usually takes like seven, ten years. Uh, if you look at the other uh, players in the market, at some point you are so big that you are just you no... Know, Uh, getting out of the uh, of the of the of the market by having pretty legacy stuff, but then if you are smart enough, brave enough, and have uh, um, significant market power, they all have the leaders. They can redefine themselves. I think that this is the 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 the, the way they can be still you know feasible. Well, I think at one point the size of your organization just hinders you from redefining yourself. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that in your DNA, let's say in Amazon, mm-hmm. um, if you don't have that as a corporate DNA, and I doubt SAP has it, um, then it's really hard to re, re- innovate yourself. Uh, and what people do is they buy, they buy, they buy mm-hmm. to compensate for internal structures. And but that's my personal take on it. I don't. Th- I think we will. SAP will always be there. But it's not that we will see cutting edge innovation coming out of SAP. I think that time is over. There will be no innovation coming out of SAP, no matter what they say. I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. You know, they are doing uh, great stuff too. Uh, so I think that you know, it probably it probably depends. But they are do- doing great stuff too. Okay, uh, what are your goals for the next years? What are your goals for the you know next year and next three years? Um, I would say no clearly defined goals. Just keep what we're doing, um, becoming the the promotion backend for more and more enterprises. We got a couple of great customers in our pipeline, but I would say you will never hear us shouting about it very loud. Um, we just try to be in the background. We never want to touch your customer, and if nobody knows we're there, we are happy. <laughs> we are happy if we're just that small promotion backend from Berlin. And um, that's good enough for us. Makes perfect sense. Thank you for our conversation. Uh, it was great talking with you, Christoph. Um, yeah, perfect. Guys, if you have any more questions uh, to me or Christoph, please uh, post them uh, and, and we will try to answer. And please post them in the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the CTO to CTO podcast. If you enjoyed this show and if you found this episode useful and informative in any way, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This can help us tremendously in reaching other listeners who might also be interested in these topics. And of course, as always, we'll be back with great content next week.